Yes, and I'll also just note uh, that I have been called to testify on this issue since 2006 and been writing about it since 2005. So um, similarly to your point, this is not a new issue in response to recent decisions. Um, so the separation of powers argument, I, I find, a, uh, confuses me because, of course, I think we all know from you know, civics classes, separation of powers is, of course, a constitutional principle which means that the branches should have some uh, separate spheres of, of conduct and some separate roles in our constitution. But checks and balances is equally important. And the role of the Congress is to establish the Supreme Court. It's not just permitted, it's required. The Supreme Court of the United States is constitutionally mandated under Article Three, But there is no detail about how it is to operate because that was left to the Congress of the United States under Article I, Section 8, the Necessary and Proper Clause. And immediately, Congress agreed to do that in the Judiciary Act of 1789, as it was required to do. The, the Congress sets the size of the Supreme Court. That is not in the hands of Chief Justice Roberts and his colleagues. Congress establishes the quorum requirement. That is not in the hands of Chief Justice Roberts and his colleagues. When this Congress says, passes a law that says that they must recuse themselves, the judges and justices of our federal judiciary, when there are certain conflicts of interest, the justices are not free to say, that law doesn't apply to me. I'm going to sit on that case anyway. And so what is troubling is there is an implication in the recent statement of policy, uh, uh, of ethics policies, as well as some previous um, statements by the court, that it doesn't think these laws bind it. And I find that very confusing in light of the text structure and long history of congressional administration of the courts. Thank you. Judge